we'll get started with it anyway. All right, so got a game for you. Um, I actually played it earlier today, and I occasionally will throw out E4, and when they play E5, I, I believe in in playing the Spanish. Like that's just how it is with if I play E4. And my opponent decided to throw out there the Schliemann. So, there are a lot of really nasty lines with the Schliemann. But to me, I found a line that I liked when, when doing your repertoire, and I stick, stick by that line. Can you remember, just by seeing this position, what the key idea is? Because that's how you know if you know you're opening or not. Because I have never played this in a game before, by the way. But I remembered it from your notes when I wrote it. And that's the only reason I got it right. I don't know why I was doing D4. Oh, no. D4's got to be bad. It's got to be. Because he can play, like, anything. I don't know. <laughs> um, D3. Knight C3 leads to pawn takes. Knight takes D5. And then nastiness. And the people playing black understandably know the theory. Well, they typically grab here, and then they go knight f6. So, I may have messed up the move order some, but I got the idea right. What you need to notice about this position that makes it significant, and the main reason I'm doing this lesson is not because of the quality of the game, but to really emphasize when learning your openings, it's all about a key memory marker, a key moment that will signify your development, and then that'll help with multiple moves after that, or will create a bind. In this case, Black's King wants to go kingside, but with the F pawn missing, we have an extra added idea that's kind of interesting here, and it made an impression on me, which is why I remember it. You don't simply just move the bishop back. That's not gonna cut it. So first, I go queen d3, and when he goes bishop c5, I castle, and then I go queen c4. And this is a very, very tricky move because I remembered the position, which instead of bishop g4, it's supposed to be queen e7, and on knight c3, bishop d7, and then knight d5, and this position gets blown up and then it's knight takes e5 here. Right. And I mean, this, this position's been played numerous times, and white wins like almost 70%. And it's by and large forced. So it's a solid, simple position versus the Schliemann. It doesn't give the Schliemann player what they want, which is a nasty blow-up position. And queen c4 is annoying as it can be. So it made an impression on me. I'm like, I don't get to play like a stutter step with a queen ever, and it's good in the opening. That's the memory marker. That's the key in this position. So my opponent didn't go for that. And, of course, I'm already out of book. Like, I just remember the queen c4 idea. Now I'm playing chess on my own. So I see bishop g4, and I'm like, what would you do here and why? This is, this is a key moment. It is a three-minute game, and I've never played this position before in my life. So you guys have a little bit more time. What would you play with white here? Knight g5, it sticks out. That's kind of interesting. Uh-huh. Anybody else? Yeah, Zach? Uh, maybe queen e6. Well, you hang your queen there. But I did have that idea later. If his bishop takes my knight, then queen e6 will be a possibility. And I evaluated that my king wouldn't exactly be unsafe if, you know, he took my knight. So, I played knight c3, but there's definitely much better. Bishop g5 just develops. I, I don't know. Maybe he goes like h6 g5 and then uses that against you at some point. Uh-huh. Demil? Um, bishop takes knight, pawn takes knight, and then, I mean, pawn takes bishop, and then knight takes c5. Why not just... Knight takes e5 immediately. Shut up. You did not think that. I did. Stop. No. No, that is BS. I'm calling pure BS on you because everybody had time. 
And you didn't say crap. You say that every time. BS. Every time. Every time. I'm not joking. Okay. All right. Stop. 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 I was just giving you crap. Okay. So knight takes e5. You don't need to take the knight on c6 because it's pinned. And that pretty much just like wins on the spot. Of course, I missed this. You missed it? Yeah, I missed this move. But this is why I go over my games after I play them. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> Zach's like, oh, <laughs> like my cat didn't die, man. Like I just missed a decent move. I'm, it's not like I'm worse. So I played knight c3. He grabbed, and then he goes knight h5. And I think a lot of you guys hesitate to play these types of positions because you're like, oh my god, my king's open. I'm gonna die. Because you sound like that exactly, of course. But you're not at, at all. You can use the open file most of the time. So I just went king h1. And gradually my advantage slipped away some. But I was confident in the position that I had, even though I was worse. Because my opponent's rated about 2,000 on feet, or, uh, Lee Chess. And typically, like, from my experience, anybody under 2,300 on Lee Chess struggles with in-game play. So if I can just get an equalish in game with an imbalance, I'm going to outplay him every time. As long as I don't flag. So he goes queen h4. Now, here's a good moment. I mean, I had this plan in mind because I mentioned it earlier. Queen check. But first I take this guy because I'm messing with the pawns. Then I go queen check. Now what's the follow-up? Why didn't he go queen block? I think he, he's still playing for the attack, like he's going to have something. Rook G1, maybe? Yeah. Rook G1? I won. If Rook G1, maybe queen takes F2. Yeah. Rook G5. No, because knight can block. But then still, you get the rook. Yeah, that's true. Um, Rook G1 is maybe okay. I'm trying to figure out why it's wrong. Yeah, maybe I can play defense in some way. And then the F2 pawn is still kind of weak. I play queen g4. I was going to say that. Well, okay, okay, Zach. Well, let's see if you see the follow-up then. If black plays bishop takes F2, what is best for white? Okay, so if bishop takes f2, what's white's move? Nope. We know you know, Well, I mean... Oh, take it. How can you take it? With the queen. Bishop, See it now? So, when I played queen e6, I saw this, and I was like, oh, dude's going to play a quick move and be like, ah, oh, free pawn, <laughs> and then I'm just going to win the game. But he played queen takes, which fixes my pawns. And now I was like, okay, I'm just going to go into this inferior ending. And I think it's very instructive. Like... One, if you're playing black here and you're just trying to hold, you can play bishop d4 immediately here. And I'm going to play knight d1 and I'm going to slowly uncoil to keep my peace. But you have some interesting ideas. Black is a bit better, but he needs to really work the position with the b to make it count. And he did not do that at all. So I think the rest of the game's instructive because my opponent had a big opportunity here for the game and missed it. He goes g5, and one of the main things I'm concerned with is the h file getting open under favorable circumstances, or him playing d5. I need to get the queenside pawns on optimal squares, so first, let's secure the pawn structure, 
And then when he hits on the B file, I'm just going to go knight a4, tickle the bishop, protect the b pawn. The bishop optically looks good there, but it doesn't do anything. So let's protect the knight, get a pawn on the opposite color of the bishop. And now I'm trying to clamp down on control over d5. And my opponent played a very good move here. He played d5 himself. What do you do here with white? Uh-huh. Uh, take with the e pawn. So we want to fix this pawn structure? Mm-hmm. Uh, I can't remember which rook I played. I think I played rook f d1. Because any way I take, I help out his pawn structure some. And... Knights are better in closed positions. So I want to keep the position closed. So he closes it. And this looks like a menacing pass pawn. And here I should just play knight c5 and I'm better. But I had a brain fart here and I'm like, I'm going to make sure that no pawn can ever protect his pawn. And I knew that I would have enough time that he has no breakthroughs anywhere that I can just maneuver around and eventually my knight will reach a good square. So I knew this position was winning for white, but in this against the opponent that I was playing, but I don't like that I missed so many opportunities to play better when I was looking at this with the engine, which I don't have the analysis in front of me. So king e7, and my idea with the, the rook was I was going to stutter step <laughs> and do that type of stuff and walk around. But when he goes here, it's easy to mess up. Because if you go rook b2 now, he, he goes rook takes a4, and then the pin's pretty devastating. So I'm like, okay, well, if he abandoned this whole h5 idea, now I can move my king over to blockade, and then that frees up my rooks. So that stops him from doing anything. And when he returns to this idea, I'm like, okay, I'll just make sure you can't get the open file. Eliminate counterplay. So now my king's on the optimal square, and gradually it's improved. And I'm like, okay, time to get the knight into the game. Here, you can't allow him to double because he'll have full control of the open file. So I clip. And then blockade on a light square so the bishop can't force me off of it. Now my knight's on a good square. He can start picking at pawns. And here I made another mistake. I should have just went after the c-pawn. But I decided to play e5. And I didn't want to take on d4 immediately. And keep in mind, my opponent is like down to less than 10 seconds. And I've got like a minute, minute and a half in this three minute game. So I didn't want to let him in still, so I didn't take on d4. So I'm just like milking the position for everything I can get. And then, you know, he fell apart. Yeah. And then that's the end of the game. But it was two different elements which I wanted to introduce the, the game to you guys. One, it was... This very nice idea in the, the Schliemann and the concept of memory markers in your openings. Because most of the time, your openings have a structure. If you remember the structure, that's step one with learning. Step two is, what is the significant move that makes this variation different from others? Like, what you play all the time. If you could remember that memory marker, that significant move, then you're going to be able to remember the position and play it at a very high level. And... That's basically all, all that's that's to it. And then secondly, making your minor piece better than your opponents at the end of the game. Like I outplayed him from the inferior position with the knight. So take that into account as you're playing your games. So join us for the next one.